Rapa Nui, or Easter Island as it's commonly known, is one of the most isolated inhabited islands in the world. Located far out in the Pacific Ocean, it only measures about 23 kilometers across between the farthest corners, with a total area of around 63 square miles. The island is an ancient volcanic system rising above the ocean as a set of mainly three coalesced volcanoes, which is what gives the island its roughly triangular shape. The whole island also includes many smaller ancient volcanic cones which you can see clearly on satellite imagery, as well as lava tube caves underground with multiple cave entrances meeting at the sea. The island is generally believed to have been inhabited around the 10th to the 11th century, which is when most of the older cultural statues and carvings are dated to around. But some researchers also believe that small groups of settlers from eastern Polynesia may have arrived by as early as the 1st to the 4th century. We've discovered writings of theirs in a language called Rongo Rongo, but it's different to that of any surrounding island and mainland area and is yet to be translated, which would undoubtedly teach us a lot. There are only a small number of remaining texts, and due to the lack of illustrations etc for context, we may never know what the writings say, and many historians believe it may even be some kind of proto-writing, and not a fully developed language, so it may even turn out to be impossible to decipher. The island is known most notably for the iconic Maui statues and ceremonial platforms called Ahu that are placed around the island, which was said to have been created between the 10th and the 16th century, of which there are over 950 Maui found so far. Not sure if there are any more yet to be found, but they range between 2 metres and 10 metres, and the largest fully excavated one is estimated to weigh around 80 tonnes. There is also a shorter squatted Maui that weighs around 87 tonnes, there are also many Maui that haven't been fully excavated, indicating that they stopped working rather abruptly for some reason. The largest unexcavated statue is around 20 metres and is believed to weigh between 180 and 240 tonnes. That thing would have been colossal if it was completed and would have towered above every other structure. I wonder where they were planning on placing it as well. Archaeologists generally think they were transported to their sites and Ahus by walking them and they have said to have been walked through local oral tradition. National Geographic covered a team demonstrating this technique on a 10-foot tall Maui with much success. But would this technique even be possible with the 33-foot tall 80-ton Maui? Perhaps with enough people? Don't know. Many inland were buried up to their necks for an unknown reason. Some think they may have been lowered into already dug holes to secure them. But the lower portion of these statues are also finely carved, so why would you go through the effort of carving and shaping the entire body if you were just going to hide the lower portion? So this doesn't make sense to many researchers. Other theories for them being buried up to their necks include sediments deposited from tsunami type events to gradual landslides of mud from the hills. But mudslides have a lot of mass behind them, so it would have had to be a very gradual one for it to have not pushed the statues over for example and in some places the angles of the buried statues are very inconsistent, so how they were buried is still very much up for debate. There are also over 300 ceremonial platforms and thousands of structures related to agricultural, funeral rites, housing, production and various other activities, so there was clearly a rich culture thriving here centuries ago, and recent research and theories are starting to point towards a far more cooperative and integrated society than people generally think of this culture being. And though many think they destroyed themselves through over-farming and internal warring, the culture still lives on today, and there were external events that devastated the island's population, not giving them a chance to recover independently, unfortunately. And for example, Dale Simpson Jr., an archaeologist from the University of Queensland, says, Ancient Rapa Nui had chiefs, priests, and guilds of workers who fished, farmed, and made the Maui. There was a certain level of socio-political organisation that was needed to carve almost a thousand statues, indicating that their social structure must have collapsed in a relatively short period of time for all work to halt and the population to decrease. I'll come back to these events shortly as it was truly awful for the Polynesians of Rapa Nui. The island unfortunately suffered from deforestation and species being led to extinction over time, some from gradual overhunting and overfarming, which is relatively easy to imagine with the small size of the island and how isolated it is. It's also been shown that at least part of the deforestation appeared to occur due to a Polynesian rat species which was taken to the island, and basically they ended up feeding on the seeds and nuts that fell from the trees, preventing refertilization of the foliage and contributing perhaps primarily to the deforestation of Rapa Nui. We don't know if the rats made it over sneaking into canoes, or if they were taken over there intentionally by the travellers, 
but in studies done on bodies excavated from the island, it's shown that up to about the year 1650 at least, some individuals use Polynesian rats as their main source of protein. So because of the rapid reproduction capabilities of rats, they may have been taken over as at least a backup food source perhaps. I'll put a link to this research from the University of California in the description anyway, as it offers some interesting insight into their diet on such an isolated island for centuries. The Rano Raraku Volcano Quarry is said to be the only production site for the Maui statues, due to its abundant source of volcanic tuff, and nearly half of all the island's Maui statues are situated around this area. There were also giant hats found called Pukau, which go on top of the Maui's heads, and are cut from a different quarry of red scoria on the other side of the island. These hats weigh up to 13 tons, and there's still much debate on how the ancient Polynesians positioned the hats on the statues, but so far the best explanation includes the quarried stones being cut cylindrical so they could roll it to the desired Maui, then rolled up a ramp perhaps using a basic power buckling technique, then finishing the stonework when it's in place on the head. All the Maui were also found to be facing inland with their backs faced to the ocean, as if to watch over the people or the villagers. Except for the seven placed on the Ahu Akivi, which all face out to sea, apparently to help travellers find the island, although it's placed 2.3 kilometres inland, and it curiously has Maui which are almost identical in design, and the Ahu also has extremely precise alignment, with the Maui facing the sunset during the spring equinox, and their backs facing the sunrise on the autumn equinox. This Ahu also seems to be the only structure on the island that features such astronomical precision, and so obviously held significant importance to the people of Rapa Nui. An extremely unfortunate point in time for Rapa Nui was when the slave traders invaded the island in 1862. They kidnapped nearly 1,500 islanders to be sold in Peru as domestic servants and manual labourers, which was bad enough. But then when Peru was forced to cease the slave trade and return some of the islanders, they overpacked an old decrepit ship where only 15 survived out of the 100 or so Rapa Nui people who were packed into the ship. And on top of that, they arrived back to Rapa Nui bringing smallpox with them, and reportedly by 1877 there were only 111 people left on the island. We still also don't know why the work on the numerous Maui's was halted, as when Europeans first arrived in 1722 on Easter Sunday by the way, the reason why it's nicknamed Easter Island, the population was estimated to be about two to 3,000 people, and in 1774 British explorer James Cook visited the island and estimated its population to be around 700 after his team doing a thorough survey of the island, they also only saw three or four canoes, all unseaworthy, so this is a significant population drop in 50 years, and the slave traders arrived nearly another century after that, showing that the population was actually recovering again before being desecrated in the 1800s. With many signs of neglected areas and a significant drop in the population, it appears to indicate that something happened with their society sometime during the late 1600s which started the collapse before the Europeans even arrived. Another reason it seems internally driven is that the last of the Maui's was estimated to have been constructed during the second half of the 1600s, which was around half a century before the Europeans even showed up, and nearly 200 years before the slave traders. So why the work on the remaining Maui stopped suddenly around that time still remains a mystery. But it does seem like the collapse started due to internal conflicts and possibly thinning resources to support a large population, with some archaeologists estimating there may have been 10 to 12,000 people inhabiting the island only decades before the collapse started. I'll wrap it up around there anyway for now. So what do you think? Well, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, like, share and leave a comment with your thoughts. Thank you again and take care of yourselves out there.